Almighty God, we come here and gather in this sanctuary, this sacred place, from different backgrounds, different homes, different geographic locations. But we come here to this place together at the same time to remind ourselves that we need one another, that our lives depend on one another, and that this is true not only of we who gather here today, but of our lives in relation to our neighbors and our neighbors' lives in relation to their neighbors, and that so long as humanity is fractured and divided, we will work at cross purposes, but when we are reminded that we have a parent in you, our father and mother, who gave rise to us all, well, God, then we can begin to see each other as brothers and sisters, truly brothers and sisters. And so I pray that this morning we will be reminded of this and that our eyes will be opened to the ways in which we need one another. That our eyes will be opened to the burdens that our brothers and our sisters are carrying. You have heard our prayer requests, or a few of them, but I pray that you will open our eyes and our ears to pick up on other currents, other issues that are going on in the lives of those who sit beside us in these pews. I pray that as the service progresses and as we sing more songs and as we pray with one another and listen to your word read, that we will become more aware not only of our brothers and sisters who sit beside us in the pews, but our brothers and sisters who we walk past hardly noticing on city sidewalks or drive past in cars or discount as they knock on our door for whatever purpose. God, I pray that you will open our eyes to see all of your children as you see them, beloved and cherished. And now, church, join in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the 16th chapter of Luke, verses 19 through 31. In your blue Bibles in the pews, it's page 79 in the New Testament portion. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And it reads, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. 
Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. I hesitated to preach from this passage because I, at first, couldn't find a way to preach it with really a different point than the one I made last week. Last week, Jesus told a parable uh, that criticized the structures, the economic structures of his day that uh, exploited the poor. And, of course, you can work within them if you must. And some people are very good at it, but... Jesus said, not so with the children of light. And it was a a scathing condemnation of greed and where greed leads. And here, uh, just a few words later, Jesus tells another parable that seems to make the same point. And it is boring to preach the same sermon twice. And it's boring to listen to the same sermon twice. But something caught my attention. Something that I think is actually the heart, the root of the problem. The problem between these two men, these two neighbors, is not that one is extravagantly wealthy and that one is poor, but the nature of their relationship and how the relationship is characterized in the way that the money is aggregated in the story. There's a chasm between them. And that chasm keeps the resources that the rich man holds away from the poor man who desperately needs them, his neighbor. I think that that gap between them really is the problem. The gap between them really is the problem. That word chasm that Abraham says cannot be crossed in the next life I think begins now. And when I began to think in those ways, I began to notice it all around me all the time. I began to notice it when I passed between, uh, passed by a person who was my neighbor, somebody who I recognized but did not know their name this week, on the sidewalk. I thought that person's world is a world away from mine. Then there's those very obvious gaps between us and others, barriers of language, barriers of race, barriers of economic status. There are any number of ways, there are many ways in which we are divided. In this story, we have two men who, in terms of geographical locations, were right next to one another, but still a world apart. The man is outside of the rich man's gate. The rich man is not given a name. Lazarus is given a name. Lazarus means the one who God helps. I like that. But in his life on earth, it seemed like there was no one there to help him. He is waiting outside for crumbs from the table of a man who we read feasts sumptuously. The same kind of language is used to describe the meal that the prodigal son's father makes for his son upon his return. In other words, it's a feast fit to feed a community, but for one guy decked out in purple. Purple, the color of royalty, of nobility, hard to come by. The purple dye was made from a sea snail, if you can believe it. And to get that sea snail out of the ocean, and I don't know what they do, mash it up into purple dye, I don't know the process, but that process is rather complex and it speaks to a complex economic system. And the fact that this man is wearing the purple, feasting sumptuously, says he is at the top. There were even laws about who could and could not wear purple in those days. And Lazarus is outside of the man's gate. And it might as well have been a world away. 
but the man has a gate. And I get it. When I um, leave a restaurant downtown and I'm holding the leftovers of a sumptuous meal in a little bag and I walk past somebody who appears hungry, I, I kind of wish I had a gate in my worst moments. I don't want to deal with the discomfort. Uh, the, the decision, uh, do I condescend? Ugh. But that's how I feel about it. And, and, you know, it'd be easier just to block it off and not see it. A gate will do the trick or a wall. And he's wanting the crumbs that comes from the man's table. In other words, the crumbs that comes from the man's table are enough to keep a human alive and I really begin to see myself in this rich man as I throw away the half-eaten pieces of pizza that I did yesterday off of my children's plates or as I'm aware of the vegetables that we have kept too long and they begin to rot and then we throw them out of our house and you can read about the millions of pounds of food that we throw out in our culture every year. Now I'm beginning to see that I wish I could find myself in the... Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the preferred character in this parable, you know, the, the Lazarus who in the end is sitting at the place of honor. But in this parable, I think I'm more closely related to the rich man. As a matter of fact, I know that I am. But then he dies. They both die. And the eyebrows would raise to the first hearers of the story when they notice that Lazarus is whisked up on, with the arms of angels. Their mind would immediately go to those people in their tradition, the prophets, the holy people who had been taken up like Elijah in a chariot, or Enoch, who was so righteous that he did not die, but just kind of drifted off to be with God. This man, who is at the bottom of the caste system upon his death, is given that kind of deferential treatment. The rich man, well, he's buried. The end. And then they find themselves in this place where they can see one another from far off, and the rich man sees the father of his faith, Abraham. He calls him Father Abraham. Three times he calls him Father in this story. And he's not wrong. He's a Jewish man. This is the father of his, this is his great, 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 however many great grandfather, his ancestor. And he's in all of the good stories, the foundational stories that gave his people an identity. And now he's seeing them. I bet he's a bit starstruck. He hardly notices the man who is sitting, depending on how you read it, right next to Abraham in the place of honor, or some ancient manuscripts say in his bosom, like Abraham's hugging him like this. I mean, Lazarus goes from last to exalted. And I'm reminded of other places in the scriptures. Jesus said it many times. The last will be first and the first will be last in the realm of God. And here you see it playing out. Abraham holding his child. And the rich man just can't see it. Can't see him, Lazarus. Can't see him for who he has always been, a beloved child of God. And he begins to make requests of Lazarus, just like he might have if Lazarus had been his servant in his house. Go fetch me some water. Actually, he speaks over Lazarus and at Abraham and says, tell your, your guy, to get me some water. He says, the gap between your world and his is too far. No one can cross it. And that's too bad. The rich man still doesn't get it and says, all right, send him on an errand with a message back to my father's house and my five brothers who are cut from the same cloth. These are his people. He names them as brothers, but I'm sure there were others in his circle that were, well, he thought of his brothers. 
Go send the man who used to beg by my gates out and tell my, warn my brothers. And Abraham says, hey, even if they went, even if they went, even if he went, no one would believe the deep truths. Here is the deep truth. There are two children of Abraham in this parable. Lazarus and the rich man. They're brothers. The rich man wants to send Lazarus out to his brothers. But Lazarus is his brother. And this was true the whole time. That was his brother out by the gates begging. The dogs kind of got it. You know, dogs are pack animals, and they care for one another, and when one is wounded, they will lick the wounds of the other. So it's almost as if the dogs in this parable on a deep and intuitive level know that the same God that gave them life gave Lazarus life too. He can work with it. It's a beautiful thought. But they were brothers the whole time, and all of a sudden I realized that there are people all around me on the other side of metaphorical, figurative gates, or literal gates, that for whom I've convinced myself I, I, are of no relation to me, their lives are of no import to me. And this parable busts through those barriers and says, everyone that you have met is important to God, and you are a child of God, and so are they. And so their life, their well-being matters, should matter to you. That's why when we come here to church, we switch the language and begin to call each other brother and sister. This isn't just a folksy way of endearing ourselves to one another. It's naming the reality that is true on the outside of these church walls, but in the inside, we are reminded of it in a deep and profound way. It's why when we take communion, we call it communion, the same from the same root word from which we get words like community, how we organize together, communication, how we come to know one another, which is why this morning I'm so glad we're taking it by intention because the way we do it now in our own individual silos in different parts of the sanctuary doesn't help us envision the deep truths of this sacred meal, which is that when we come to the same table and drink from the same cup and break from the same bread, we realize that we are a family. And that's not only true of me and you, it's true of you and everyone else besides. The key is waking up to this reality. And when you do, our responsibilities to one another change in challenging ways. And sure enough, just like every other week, when I'm writing a sermon like this, something happens in my life that challenges me directly, in a direct way related to the sermon that I am writing. I, I, was, I was dotting the I's and crossing the T's of this sermon when at 11 o'clock on one of the weeknights this week, uh, I hear a, a pop and a scream. Not a gunshot, just to get ahead of that suspicion, but I hear a pop and a scream. And so I go outside and I see a car down at the end of my street. And sometimes you can just tell by the way it's being handled that someone's not quite right in the driver's seat. Uh, the, the, the car was behaving drunk and I suspected the driver was. So I make note of that. It's just sort of backing up, up and off onto the sidewalk, backward, forward, backward, forward. And then I look in front of my house and there is a side mirror I go and pick it up. It's off of my neighbor's car. Great. I hate getting thrust into the middle of these things. This is where you actually need a gate so other people's problems do not become your own. And I tell Kelly at the door, call our neighbor, tell them about their car. They get out of bed. They're clearing the sleep from their eyes. In the meantime, the woman who is driving the car begins to make her way down the street toward my house. And at that point, I recognize her. She is my neighbor. And yes, she is very drunk. Stumbling and loud and weepy and afraid. 
and confused. But she recognizes me. I've spoken to her about three or four times, and I still could not remember her name. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. She blames the narrow streets. She says that people ought to be tucking their mirrors in. Um, right? And in the meantime, my neighbor is trying to figure out if, there's, if she has insurance, and she was so incoherent, she had trouble understanding his question, and he never got an answer, and he just said, I'll take care of it tomorrow. I'm going to bed. Goes back inside. The woman, in the meantime, begins to tell me how she's afraid to go home because her husband is mean, is the way she puts it. He's mean, and this is his car. I say, ma'am, if you, if you feel unsafe, you should probably call someone. Oh, it's okay, my mother's home, my mother's home. And then when I most want to get away, she approaches me and hugs me and says, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can smell the booze coming out of her. And she says, I love you, thank you, thank you. And um, I thought I heard the voice of God say, this is your sister. This is your sister. What does it mean now that that person is your sister? And how does that change the nature of your relationship with her? Made sure she got home safe. That's what I would do with, for my sister. Made a note to self that I would follow up and find out if she's doing okay a few days later. That's what I would do for my sister or my brother. And you know, many people could hear a message like this and walk away in disbelief. That is how the parable ends. It says if someone goes from the dead and speaks to my brothers, they will, they will believe, they will believe the deep truths of God. And Abraham says, even if someone comes back from the dead, they will not listen. We serve a risen Savior. Our whole, our religious foundation is built on the belief that a man who was God rose from the dead. And if it was that one who told us this story, will we repent? Tear down the barriers, break down the walls, and see each and every other person for who they are, our brothers and our sisters. Will we believe the one who told this story? I will try. Yesterday, imagine a 400-foot table that was on 39th Street between Meridian and Illinois. And it was set, nicely fine dining, cups, bread, and all from the community were welcome. You could seat 300 people. This happened yesterday in Indianapolis. People of different ethnicities, different economic backgrounds gathered around one table for the purpose of saying, what do we do in our community? What conversations do we need to have that there are people starving, that we are in one of the largest food deserts in the United States, Indianapolis is. I wish more knew about what happened yesterday. And it's just the beginning of the conversation of the light bulb of what's happening around us. But the beauty that happened where Josie sat next to me and she said, Mom, I want some more bread. And Zach, who is a neighbor we found out that lives on our street when he visits his dad, passed her the basket. Would she have met him any other time? Or Mary, who is just a few seats down, I met after when we played at the park. Her son goes to Josie's school 
and she has a vision to work her family farm and be one of the many few black farmers in Indianapolis, and she wants to provide fresh produce and meat for Indianapolis. Dreams were casted and relationships were built. It didn't fix any problem yet, but it's just the beginning. So I envision here at Northwood as we gather around this table and we physically pick some bread and we dip it in the cup, the fellowship, the oneness that's coming together. Don't miss it. Do you see it? Do you see your neighbor right next to you? Look next to you. Look, look, look around. Look behind you. Go ahead. They're here. That's your neighbor. That's your brother. That's your sister. And there's more that can come around this table. So we thank God for the gifts, the bounties given us, and the call God asked us to share with our neighbor and to become one, because this is one bread, one cup, one body. And I'll let Pastor pray for us over these <laughs> elements. What you should know if you are our guest is this is an open table, so all are welcome to break bread with us and to take from the cup. This week we are doing it by intinction, which means that we will come forward, starting with the front rows and working our way back, and you'll pick off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and eat it on the spot. And if you are unable to make it forward, or if it's a challenge to make it forward, we will bring it to you once everyone has come, come forward. So, so don't feel, if it's, a, if it's a struggle to get forward, please just um, sit, be comfortable, we'll bring it to you. And I, I love, we don't usually do communion by attention, as you know, but I love the visual image that it gives us of us all coming together to the same space. The communion table is not like a private prayer closet space. It's the place where we open our eyes and see one another. It's the most precious space in this building and in our community. And we do this every week because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after he'd given thanks for it, he broke it. And he passed it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is being broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out. He blessed it, gave it to his disciples saying, this is my blood which is being shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you take of the bread or you drink of this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until his return.
bread of life. Family's messy, you know. could see this morning that the problem in the parable was not that one man was rich and one man was poor, but that they could not bridge the distance between them. When you look at it that way, we're all in this boat. We all have gaps and chasms between us and others that we need to bridge in the name of God and by God's love and grace. And so brothers and sisters, leave this place and meet your other brothers and sisters and find ways of drawing near to them, inviting them into this holy communion. Go with God and have a wonderful week.